Now, seemingly loved by those that consider tailgating and driving like a complete Muppet as a talent, the F33 series, when it was brand new, which was well over a decade ago, was filled to the brim with new technology and featured a, a range of turbocharged engines. But the thing is, new technology becomes old technology, and BMW have developed a, uh, let's say, an interesting reputation when it comes to reliability these days, so it begs the question, should you ever seriously consider buying a used F33 series? Let's find out. Now look, obviously not all BMW owners are a nightmare. There are dozens of them out there that drive like completely stable and mature adults. But it's no secret that BMW fans are incredibly passionate both when driving their cars and driving their keyboards. And most hardcore BMW fans are gonna know the ins and outs of the F33 series like the back of their hand. But for us normal people, it does require some explaining because this is incredibly complex. The good news is that once you do understand the complexity, it's a bit like learning a, a different language, like say Mandarin Chinese. Once you know it, it, it's still a bit confusing. Anyway, look, first up you have three body types. This, the F30 sedan, then the F31 wagon, or Touring as BMW calls it, and the F34 horribly grotesque lift back mistake thing, or Gran Turismo. This was also the first generation that saw the coupe and convertible body styles separate from the 3 Series moniker to become the 4 Series, even though loads of what we're about to talk about will relate to the 4 Series too. Now engines and models for the Aussie variants, basically all the engines are turbocharged and here in Australia are all rear wheel drive, but depending on the body style and the model year, you have a choice of two different 4 cylinder diesel engines in 3 states of tune, a 3 cylinder petrol, 4 different 4 cylinder petrol engines in 5 states of tune, 2 inline 6s with their own outputs, 4 and 6 cylinder hybrids and a partridge in a pear tree. And depending on the year and the model, these are then available with either an 8-speed automatic or a 6-speed manual, although most on the used market are going to be an auto because people suck. I'm kidding, obviously. Then we have the model year debacle because what stuff a 3 Series features will vary thanks to the updates in 2013 and 2014, but most substantially the mid-cycle or LCI update in 2016. This LCI update was a biggie, mechanically loads changed, everything was updated, it's far more than just a facelift. Then you'll have a choice of line packages or trim specs like Sport Line, Luxury Line, Modern Line, High Line, M Sport, Touring Individual, they all feature different features and accessories. Plus, then you have the optional extras which we're not going to elaborate on otherwise our brains are going to melt out of our ears. Now because of this utter confusion of 3 series details, if we were to cover off all of the specific details in this video, it'd be the most boring video in the world. But if you do need those specific details, jump on Redriven.com and check out the cheat sheet. It's like the ultimate used F33 series buyer's guide. Now, if you're considering buying one of these because, you know, quality German engineering and manufacturing, it's important to know that the majority of these 3 Series here in Australia, they weren't made in Germany. They were made in South Africa. Not necessarily a bad thing, but certainly not Germany. Also in this video, we're not going to be talking about the M3 at all because, honestly, it deserves its very own video, which we've already made, and the link for which is just up here somewhere. Okay, now interior-wise, look, this is a generation old, but it doesn't feel it. Like, it still looks and feels really, really modern. Obviously, the materials used, they're going to vary depending on, you know, the model year, the trim spec, all that sort of stuff. In this car, everything you touch does feel nice. This up here, not that you touch this bit very often, but it does feel a little scratchy. It's still squidgy enough, but, yeah, just a little bit on the harsh side. And this, I love. Yummy, yummy buttons. I know touch screens are all the, fa the fat at the moment and it's cheaper to manufacture for manufacturers, but this, I just love that there's buttons. Obviously also iDrive, we'll talk about that a little bit more in a second, but yeah, buttons, and they all feel good. Actually, everything you use, like paddles, everything that you use still feels good. Now, seats and driving position. First of all, seats, fantastic, heaps of adjustability, and the driving position, pretty much perfect, honestly. I love these seats, I love the driving position. Well done. Now, wear and tear on this particular car, this is this owner's everyday driver, and wear and tear is pretty good. There is a little bit of, I suppose, wear and tear here on the on the door handle because it protrudes a little bit, and the leather on the seats, it's getting, it's not bad. It could probably be, probably be regenerated a little bit with some uh, like a, a quality detail. Just a little bit harsh, but besides that, everything is good. The steering wheel still feels really nice. Here's a tip, manufacturers. 
why don't you go with this brushed aluminium look instead of your high gloss black plastic because this doesn't scratch anywhere near as easily. Now practicality in the front, you've got some excellent size door bins and also they're really easy to get big water bottles in and out. You've got uh, two cup holders here, little charging port there, spot perfectly sized for your phone here. Uh, also the cup holders have trap doors in case you need to hide the fact that you drink small pretentious coffees. You should be proud of that. Don't be afraid of telling people that you drink a small pretentious coffee. You've got storage in the center console here and Mardi Gras is on in Sydney at the moment so this is extremely appropriate. Well done. Plus this armrest slides back and forth. Pretty good size glove box there. Nothing kind of under the seat specifically. Nowhere for your sunglasses. Nothing under here. There you go. Now speaking of another series that comes in a three, in the back seat I'm exactly 9.6 centimeters taller than Lord of the Rings wizard Gandalf. This is in my driving position. Pretty comfortable, heaps of knee room, heaps of you know room in general. The seats are a little bit on the firm side, if I'm gonna be really critical, but yeah, it feels quite nice to be back here. Could spend hours back here comfortably. Now, wear and tear wise in the back seat, as I said, this is this owner's everyday driver. And you can kind of tell a little bit, like the seats, again, just, I feel like it just needs a really solid detail to get this leather back to its best. It's just a bit on the firm side. And also some of the paint's kind of peeling off this door handle again. But besides that, yeah, honestly, a detail and this thing will look a million bucks. And practicality in the back seat, you've got your own air vents, you've got a little charging port down here, you've got some nets in case you go fishing and you need to put your fish somewhere. Okay, pretty small size door pockets there. You've got an armrest here with an opening kind of trapdoor style cup holder and also this whole center section oh, can easily flip forward in case you, I don't know, are a pole vaulter, you need to put your pole somewhere. Now practicality in the boot is pretty average. I say pretty average because it's pretty much bang on average for this category of car. Some cars are bigger, some cars are smaller. It's not too bad, plus the seats can fold flat. Now, as we mentioned, what stuff you get will vary enormously depending on the year model and the trim spec. And if you do need all of the absolute specific details, Redriven.com, that'll have everything you need to know. But even if you go for an early base model, you're still gonna get dual zone climate, Bluetooth, leather trim, and all of this stuff and more. Plus, if you already own one of these, it comes with one of these. Now, this is called an indicator. I know a lot of BMW owners really struggle with this, but basically what it does, if you push it down, it makes some lights on the left-hand side of the car flash or if you push it up it makes the lights on the right hand side of the car flash what that does it indicates to those around you which direction you're intending to travel it's ingenious technology this but um yeah if you're a bmw owner have a go at using it but anyway look if you spend a little bit more money and go for a more recent top spec example you can expect to get an incredible 16 speaker harman kardon stereo heated front seats high quality leather everywhere and all of this other stuff and even more now no matter what in terms of the infotainment system you're going to be operating it via the iDrive system this iDrive unit it is a generation or two old now but it still feels great to use actually it's honestly probably my favorite i think it's the most intuitive obviously others out there will disagree they don't like iDrive but it's kind of like arguing between what's better between Apple and Android. Obviously, Apple is better, and if you disagree, it's okay. It's good to be wrong. Now, speaking of Apple and Android, most of these F33 series, they're not gonna come with Apple CarPlay or Android Auto, although it can be retrofitted. The owner of this car has actually had CarPlay fitted. I think it was around about 450 bucks from a BMW dealership, or you can get it done with, you know, from aftermarket places like that. Generally speaking, it works pretty well, but there have been some reports that some of the aftermarket Apple CarPlay and Android Auto fitments can be a little bit dodgy. Actually, speaking of dodgy things with the infotainment system, there are some things that we do need to tell you about, but we'll cover those in a sec. But in terms of safety, look, guys, this is a, it's a modern day BMW. It's absolutely loaded with safety technology. But as something of a celebration of the heritage of the F33 series, to take you through what safety features it does have, we're gonna have my South African mate tell you what it's got. As standard and from launch, the 3 Series will have six airbags, active protection systems, brake assistance, traction control, and cornering brake control. But from 2015, the 3 Series was also fitted with approach control warnings, lane departure warnings, pedestrian warnings, lane change warnings, chain warnings, BMW teleservices, and BMW intelligence emergency call. Now, honestly, guys, that's just a, a quick overview of what safety gear this has. For the full list of everything, redriven.com, check out the cheat sheet. Okay, so what's it like to drive? Well, you know what the funny thing is? I don't feel any, like, deep urge to tailgate anyone or drive like a complete dickhead. So maybe that's not the car's fault. Maybe the people that drive these like that are just... 
assholes naturally. But what you do feel instantly is that this is still clearly a driver's car. But look, to explain, let's break this down into chapters. Engine stuff. Now this is a 330i M Sport, which excluding the M3 is the second most powerful in the range and it still feels excellent, like, great. Look, honestly, this power plant, the power delivery is really smooth, really linear on response, plenty enough power to have more than enough fun. Actually, here's a fun fact. This thing has very nearly the same power to weight ratio as a Subaru WRX, but this is rear wheel drive, so therefore, arguably, more fun. Transmission stuff. Now look, many of you are gonna criticize this thing for being an automatic, and normally, normally I would agree with you. And this hurts me to say, but the auto is better than the manual. The problem with the manual, it feels like it was an afterthought. Like, I've actually been lucky enough to drive a manual one of these versus an automatic back-to-back -back on a couple of occasions. And the manual just feels a bit, yeah, just a bit underdone. Like, they didn't spend enough money or time on development. With the auto, it just, it suits the car really nicely. It's responsive, it's smooth. I feel dirty saying it, but I'd, I'd buy the auto. Look, if the manual shifter had some sort of, you know, Honda S2000 or Mazda MX-5 kind of shift feel to it, that opinion would be completely different. But it doesn't, it just, as I said, it feels a bit underdone. Bumps and corners. Okay, handling even at normal speeds around Sydney, excellent, it's still engaging and fun. However, many claim that the steering on this doesn't match up to BMW's ultimate driving machine tagline. And yeah, they do have a point. Look, it just feels the slightest bit vague. It's almost feeling like the steering is telling you what just happened moments ago rather than telling you in real time what's actually happening in the moment. I know that's kind of delving into wanker car journalist speak. I'm really sorry, but that's the truth. And the suspension after all of these years, it still feels really good, really compliant. It gives the car confidence. It is on the firm side, being an M Sport and being the 330i, but it might be a bit firm for some, but I, yeah, personally, I think it feels great. Look, yes, it is on adaptive dampers, but yeah, it is still firm. If you are after just complete luxury, maybe this isn't the one for you. Rattles and squeaks. Now, there are quite a few complaints that these things can get as rattly as a box of clothes pegs, but in this particular model, not at all. Like we've been over some pretty harsh and rough roads, but it sounds solid. Also, some other owners have complained of excessive road noise, and look, yeah, there is road noise there, but it's not deafening, it's like, it's fine, get over it. Look, in defense of the firm ride and the bit of road noise, look, BMW have attempted to make a pretty tactile premium car here, so, it's a bit of a trade-off. You can't expect like plush ride comfort and absolute silence inside, plus kind of a driver-focused feel and engagement. Anything else? Yeah, look, there is. After all of these years and many thousands of kilometers, this is still a bloody lovely car to drive. It's not perfect by any means, but very few cars are, especially in this segment. Plus, this being an LCI updated car, this features a B-series engine and not the N-series engine. And that gives you so much more confidence, and we'll get to why that is in a moment. Now, understandably, with so many different models to choose from, the pricing between cheap and expensive on the used market does vary enormously, as you can see. But the good news is, thanks to the used market compressing prices, sometimes you can pick yourself up a fully kitted, fully optioned out 3 Series for not much more than just a bog standard one. And look, yes, updated LCI models, they do ask a premium, but as you're about to see, it's sometimes worth it. However, no matter if it's a pre or post facelift model, guys, it's a BMW. Parts are gonna be asking a premium here in Australia, actually, as are all of the costs involved in maintaining them. So it's one thing to be able to afford to buy the car, but can you afford the cost to repair it if something were to go wrong? Which brings us to our next part. What goes wrong with these things? Let's start with the exterior. First of all, there are quite a few reports of people feeling nauseous or even emotional distress. Now, this generally only happens around the F34 Gran Turismo models, but the good news is the easiest way to fix it is look at something far more attractive, like a pile of dog shit. Next up, many owners have complained that the paint chips far too easily, and obviously a quality respray is bloody expensive. In really, really humid climates, some of the alloy wheels can suffer from excessive corrosion. The cable that opens the bonnet, it's known to fail, and even the car's horns, they're known to fail as well. 
Actually, maybe that's why 73 Series owners tailgate you. They can't beep you out of the way. That makes sense now. Fair enough. Now, inside, there are some reports that the F30 can be a bit of a bit of a hypochondriac because it can show random error messages and even in the worst case scenario go into a limp home mode but when the car's checked out there's nothing wrong with it. Some owners have complained that between 60 and 80 kilometers an hour the steering wheel can vibrate or actually have like a knocking effect to it. It's often a wheel balance issue but then some other owners have claimed that it's a, it's a steering system issue. Now the infotainment systems can have some issues either just showing a blank screen or completely glitching out or the parking assistant feature just not working at all it often just requires like a software refresh or an update but there have been occasions where the entire system needs to be replaced plus if the parking assistant cameras just show a black or blank screen sometimes it can be a wiring harness issue other times it can be the connectors have been exposed to water now some owners have also complained that the bluetooth connectivity with the infotainment system can be utter crap either just not connecting or dropping out once it's connected the front door seals are sometimes not installed correctly and that results in huge amounts of wind and road and outside noise entering the cabin around the a pillar around freeway speeds on some early models the seat frames are known to corrode and then get really really squeaky and even on more recent models, there have been reports that the car will show that there's someone sitting in the passenger seat when there's no one there at all. Well, maybe there is someone there and just the driver can't see them. Ooh. Now, before we get into mechanically what can go wrong with these, firstly, a huge thank you to our viewer, Nicola, for lending us his car. Mate, you're a legend. And a massive thank you to everybody in the BMW and the 3 Series communities, like forums, group pages, all that sort of stuff. Without you guys helping us research this, we couldn't make these videos. Now, guys, if you're enjoying this video and Redriven in general, if you haven't already, can you hit that subscribe and like and bell button? Because honestly, doing that, it just helps us out so, so, so much. Now, mechanically, what goes wrong with these? I have some sneaking suspicions of what goes wrong with these, but I can't tell you officially because I'm not a mechanic. Jim is. In the F30, there are about 12 or 13 different engine options. But although there are a lot of different engines, there are a lot of similarities right across the board. To keep costs down, a lot of manufacturers now are making their engines modular. What that means is a lot of the parts across all the engines are shared, same pistons and rods and timing chains, six cylinders and four cylinders alike. That is great to keep production costs down, but it also means some of the problems are shared across all the models. And one of those shared problems in this car is the timing chain. It's a very common problem. Uh, it was a known problem in the early generations and in the new generations, it is also a problem. In the newer engines though, the timing chain is at the back of the engine. So that means if it has a serious problem, the engine has to come out or the gearbox has to come out and it's eye-wateringly expensive. And typical for older BMWs and the new ones, they have problems with oil leaks from their valve cover gaskets and the oil filter housings. And typical for BMW, they do have a complicated cooling system and a lot of those parts in the cooling system are made of plastic and as they age, they do become brittle and that is a bit of a weak point. The turbos in the later models are actually less problematic than the previous generations, uh, although most of the inlet system is made of plastic. So what you're gonna see is as that ages, it will become brittle and it is gonna be a problem. Again, like a lot of BMWs for the last 10 years, they're all direct injection. So you are gonna find over time, you have a lot of problems with uh, carbon buildup on the valves, which is going to need regular cleaning to keep performance. Onto the diesels now, and surprise, surprise, they too have timing chain complications. Not as bad as the petrols though. They also have an issue with the harmonic balancer. They have EGR complications and DPF complications, which is, although fair to say, across the board with a lot of late model diesels. With so many engine options and so many variants, I can't honestly say which one is the better one to get. They're not all bad, but they all do have known issues. Now, a lot of those engine issues are related to servicing, and I know I go on about this all the time. If you have a BMW, change the oil. Change the oil every 10,000 kilometers or 6,000 miles if you swing that way, just change it regularly. The extended service intervals are a huge contributor to the reliability and the engine failures that these things have. Okay, so should you buy an F33 series? Maybe, kinda. It kinda depends on which one and on you. If you're really savvy with a spanner, adore BMWs even when they're rubbish, and have more spare time and money than you know what to do with, yeah, sure, buy a 3 Series, and any of them, because no matter how big a pain in the bum it may be, you'll still sing its praises for the rest of time. Congratulations, you are a true BMW fan. 
But for normal people, it's a bit more complex than that. We'd be avoiding any pre-LCI updated cars, especially the diesels. Look, yes, there are owners out there that have never had an issue with a pre-LCI F33 series, and there are the unicorn examples out there that will be fault-free with the right maintenance, but the chance of buying a lemon and the potential associated costs are, for us, just too risky. So no, don't buy one of them. However, post LCI update and specifically in 330i or 340i trim, it's a cautious yes from us. Sure, it might not have the same bulletproof reliability and impeccable build quality of, say, a Lexus IS, and it's still too early to judge mechanical longevity, but on a daily basis, it's simply more enjoyable than most of the competition, and there is just something incredibly unique about driving a BMW. But this then brings us to you guys. Would you buy one of these or would you buy an A4 or a C-Class or a Lexus IS or maybe a wild card like a Alfa Romeo Giulia or a Bugatti Chiron? Let us know in the comments below. See you next time. And honestly, I've gone blank on the fucking rest. That was the end of it, you dickhead. Cameras just so, blah, blah, blah. Cameras just show a blank. Plus if the parking assistant cameras just, just what is wrong with my brush to do? 